In February 1895, the Marquess of Queensbury, who was mad, called in at the Albemarle Club in London and left a card. It's difficult to be precise about what he scrawled. The Marquess's writing was not of the best. But we think it reads, For Oscar Wilde, posing Sondermite. The consequences for Wilde were immense. Trials, prison, exile, disgrace. Best summed up in the letter Wilde wrote from Reading Jail to his lover Bosey, Lord Alfred Douglas, the Marquess of Queensbury's son. The letter was published as De Profundis, From the Depths. I amuse myself with being a flaneur, a dandy, a man of fashion. I surrounded myself with smaller natures and meaner minds. I became the spendthrift of my own genius. Tired of being on the heights, I deliberately went to the depths in the search for new sensations. What the paradox was to me in the sphere of thought, perversity became to me in the sphere of passion. Desire at the end was a malady or a madness or both. I grew careless of the lives of others. I took pleasure where it pleased me and passed on. I forgot that every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character. I ceased to be lord over myself. I was no longer captain of my soul and did not know it. Was that this is a book that's all about time. There are various fascinating things about it. One is it is one of the only real modern myths that we have. And they would know about the picture of Dorian Gray. They probably wouldn't have read it. But in this book, The Picture of Dorian Gray, which is all about the ravaging effects of time, the decadent Dorian Gray uh, remains pristine and young while the picture in the attic ages horribly. There is no external referent to time in it. There are no newspapers, there's no political events in the book. It is an enclosed, tightly enclosed and claustrophobic world. Indeed, you have to read the book quite closely. Schubert, played by a girl in an exquisite dress, candles and chandeliers sparkling in her hair and eyes, art. Surface, of course, but art is all surface and symbol at once. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. You remember Basil Hallward, the painter, whose disappearance some years ago caused such public excitement and conjecture? He it was who painted that picture, that notorious picture. The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Dramatised for radio by Nick McCarty. With Jamie Glover as Dorian Gray and Ian McDermott as Lord Henry Wotton. I was in the habit then of visiting Basil's studio regularly. It was summer, and the studio was filled with the rich odour of roses. When the summer breeze stirred the trees of the garden, there came through the open door the heavy scent of lilac, or the delicate perfume of the pink flowering thorn. Well, Henry, what do you think of it? I was lying on the divan of Persian saddlebags, smoking an opium-tinted cigarette, and watching the play of light through the long tussaw silk curtains that were stretched in front of the large window. The dim roar of London was like the bourdon note of a distant organ. Well? It is quite the best thing you have done. <laughs> I believe it is. Who is the young man? A model? No, no. He is quite beautiful. You have captured more than a likeness. You must send it next year to the Grosvenor. <laughs> Why not the Academy? The Academy is too large and vulgar. Whenever I go there, there have been either so many people that I've not been able to see the pictures, which was dreadful, or so many pictures that I've not been able to see the people, which was worse. I won't send it anywhere. What odd chaps you painters are. You do anything to gain a reputation. As soon as you have one, you seem to want to throw it away. It's silly of you, for there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. I know you'll laugh at me, but I really can't exhibit it. I've put 
too much of myself into it. <laughs> I knew you would laugh. It's true, all the same. I didn't know you were so vain, Basil. I see very little of you in this. He is a Narcissus, and you... You have an intellectual expression, <laughs> but beauty, real beauty, ends where an intellectual expression begins. Don't flatter yourself, Basil. You're not in the least like him. Oh, I should be sorry to look like him. The ugly and the stupid have it best in this world. If they know nothing of victory, they're spared the knowledge of defeat. What do you know of defeat? Your rank and wealth, and my brains, and my art, whatever they may be worth. Dorian Gray's good looks. We shall all suffer for what the gods have given us. Dorian Gray. Is that his name? I didn't intend to tell you his name. When I like people immensely, I never tell their names to anyone. It's like surrendering a part of them. When I leave town, I never tell my people. I've grown to love secrecy. Is that foolish? You forget I'm married. And the one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. When we meet, my wife and I, we tell each other the most absurd stories with the most serious faces. My wife is so much better than I am, she never gets confused over the dates, and I always do. <laughs> I believe you're a much better husband than you pretend to be. You never say a moral thing, and you never do a wrong thing. Your cynicism is a pose. Being natural is a pose, the most irritating I know. <laughs> tell me truly why you refuse to exhibit his portrait. It's... It's hard for me to say. It sounds so incredible. Then I should believe you at once. I think... Well, two months ago, I was at a crush at Lady Brandon's. You know how artists have to remind the public from time to time that we're not savages. That's where I saw him, at Lady Brandon's. A peacock in everything but beauty. She insisted we met. She treats guests as an auctioneer treats his goods. The poor woman so wanted to find a salon, and she only succeeded in opening a restaurant. Harry, you have no idea of friendship. Unjust. I choose my friends for their good looks, my acquaintances for their good characters, and my enemies for their good intellects. A man cannot be too careful in the choice of his enemies. So I must be merely an acquaintance. Much more. Oof, less than a friend. A sort of brother. I don't care for brothers. My elder brother won't die, and my younger brother seem to do nothing else. <laughs> Harry, I don't believe a single word. Tell me more about Dorian Gray. How often do you see him? I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. Extraordinary. I never thought you'd care for anything but your art. He is all my art to me now. I can recreate life in a way that was hidden from me before, if he sits beside me. I must meet Dorian Gray. I insist. Harry, I, I find in him all the loveliness and subtleties of colour and line. <laughs> I cannot exhibit his portrait because I have put into it some expression of this idolatry. Idolatry? There is too much of myself in it. I cannot bear my soul to the world's eyes. I cannot. Is... Dorian Gray, fond of you. Why should he visit me if he were not? Come, Basil. Days in summer are apt to linger. There will come a day when you will be perfectly cold and indifferent when he calls, or he will be cold and indifferent to you. He likes me, I know. But sometimes he seems to take delight in giving me pain, as if my soul were a flower to put in his coat. An ornament for a summer's day. I want to meet him. I don't want you to. Mrs. Dorian Gray, sir. Are you at home? Fate, Basil. So gloriously predictable. We are both at home, Parker. Dorian Gray is my dearest friend. He has a simple and beautiful nature. Don't spoil him. Don't influence him. The world has many marvellous people in it. Don't take away from me the one person who gives my art whatever charm it possesses. Basil. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you had anyone with you. Mr. Gray. Dorian Gray. Lord Henry Wotton. He was all his portrait promised. And it was plain to see that poor Basil already bored him. Oh, 
Let's let me the music, Basil. I want to learn it. That depends on how you sit today, Dorian. You see, my lord, how easily I get into people's bad books. Not only Basil here, but Lady Agatha's too. I'll make your peace with my aunt. She is quite devoted to you. She has told me so. I promised to go to a club in Whitechapel with her last Tuesday and quite forgot. We were to play a duet together. Three duets. It won't have mattered. When Aunt Agatha sits down to the piano, she makes quite enough noise for two. <laughs> that is very horrid to her and not very nice to me. You're too charming to go in for philanthropy, Mr Grey. Far too charming. Will you smoke? Harry, I want to finish this picture today. Would you think it rude of me to ask you to go away? Am I to go, Mr Grey? Please don't. Basil is in one of his sulky moods and I can't bear him then. If Lord Henry goes, then I shall go too. It is horribly dull standing on a platform trying to look pleasant. Basil, you've often told me that you like sitters to have someone to chat to. Since Dorian wishes it, of course you must stay. And remember that Lord Henry has a bad influence over all his friends. All his friends, Basil? The single exception of myself. <laughs> is that true, Lord Henry? Are you a bad influence? There is no such thing as a good influence. Fear, shame, terror. These are the forces that drive mankind. The terror of society is the basis of morals. And the terror of God is the secret of religion. It is in the brain only that the great sins of the world take place. You, Mr. Grey, with your rose-red youth and your rose-white boyhood, have had passions that made you afraid, thoughts that have filled you with terror and shame. You bewilder me. Turn your head to the right a little, like a good boy. He stood with a small move of impatience as Basil painted away with that bold touch of his. As Basil worked, we talked, or rather I talked and the young man listened. His finely chiselled nostrils and the rebellious curls tangled in gilded shreds. Basil, I need a rest. A drink. Excuse me. I've nearly done. Parker will have put drinks in the garden. I'll finish the detail and you may come and see the finished work in a few minutes. You must not sit in the sunshine, Mr Grey. The sunburn would be quite unbecoming. What can it matter? It should matter everything to you. You have the most marvellous youth, and youth is the one thing worth having. I don't feel that, Lord Henry. When you're old and wrinkled and ugly, when thought has seared your forehead with its hideous lines and passion branded your lips with hideous fires, you will feel it then, terribly. Beauty is a form of genius. It cannot be questioned. It makes princes of those who have it. As you do. My lord. Listen to me. Time is already jealous of you and will wage war on that youth. You will become sallow and hollow cheeked and dull eyed. You will suffer horribly. Don't squander youth. It never returns. Our limbs fail, our senses rot. We degenerate into hideous puppets haunted by the memory of the passions of which we were too much afraid and the exquisite temptations to which we had not the courage to yield. Bring your drinks. Come, see the finished portrait. I watched the young man as he gazed at the shadow of his own loveliness and knew that one day what I said would become true. Time would claim him. He would wrinkle, grow dull, and be broken and deformed by age. Don't you like it? Of course he likes it. It's one of the greatest paintings in the history of modern art. I'll give you anything you like for it. I must have it. It is not my property, Harry. It's Dorian's. How sad it is. How sad. I shall grow old and horrible, but this picture will remain forever young. If only it were the other way round. I should object most strongly to that. <laughs> I believe, Basil, you like your art better than your friends. How long will you like me? Until my first wrinkle? Oh, Lord Henry is right. 
Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I am growing old, I shall kill myself. You mustn't talk like that. I shall never have such a friend as you. I am jealous of everything whose beauty does not die. I am jealous of the portrait you have painted. Every moment that passes takes something from me and gives it to that portrait. Why did you paint it? One day it will mock me horribly. I hate it. This is your doing, Harry. It is the real Dorian Gray. I'll destroy it. I'm not let a picture come between me and my two best friends. I'll cut it to ribbons now. Find the palette now. No, no, you shan't. That would be... That would be murder. The picture is a part of myself. I feel it. There is nothing, nothing in the world that I would not give to remain as I am and for the picture to grow old. I would give my soul for that. Enough. Come with me to the theatre. Both of you. <laughs> A splendid notion. You promised you'd stay and play the Schubert. I can't. I'm going to the theatre with Lord Henry. As you wish. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Dorian. Come and see me soon. Certainly. You won't forget. The portrait will be varnished then, ready for you. I won't forget. And Harry, remember what I asked you this morning. I have forgotten it. I trust you. <laughs> I wish I could trust myself. Come, Mr. Gray, my handsome is outside. The next morning, I went to see my uncle at the Albany. He would know the pedigree and family of the boy. Lord Fermor sat as usual in a chair by the fire. Rough tweeds on as rough-mannered an old bachelor as ever graced the Albany. Passed over for the embassy in Paris for which he was supremely well suited by birth, by indolence and his passion for pleasure, after which he never did another day's work. Money, is it, Harry? It's the usual reason you young dandies come to see their relatives. So damned early, too. Thought you were never abroad till five. Not money, Uncle George. It's only people who pay their bills who need money. Gray. Dorian Gray. You know his family? Gray. Grandson of Kelso, son of... My word, my dear boy. Son of Margaret Deverux, who made such a damn fool of herself running off with a penniless subaltern in some foot regiment. Beautiful as she was willful, proud girl. Ugly story. Tell it. Father sent a man, it was said. Some Belgian brute of an adventurer to insult his new son-in-law. And did more than insult him. Spitted him like a partridge. Hushed up, of course, but Kelso ate his chop alone for a long time after that. Very long time. The child was the soldier's. Of course. Is he good-looking? Moderately. If I'm any judge, he'd be more than moderately good-looking, Harry. And more than moderately well-off. Not of age yet, is he? Mm. No, can't be. His mother was a wonderful woman. Could have had any man she wanted... Carrington went on his knees to her and she laughed in his face. <laughs> Spirit, you see. Kelso brought her and the child home from Spa and took her to the country. They say she never spoke to him again. Not one word. <laughs> Wonderful girl. Spirited. Don't find him like that any longer. All Americans and meatpackers' daughters, <laughs> not stairs. <laughs> Curious that behind everything of beauty that has ever existed lies some tragedy. A vase, a building, a woman. Yet the very fact made Dorian even more perfect. How sad that he too would fade. Even my dear Aunt Agatha would understand how sad that is. Sadder even than her dreary luncheons. Aunt! Ah, oh. Late as usual, Henry. He refused to wait. I think you know most of my guests. I do, I do. Lady Harley, how charming your son looked at the ball last night. <laughs> Sir Thomas, what is it like to find you here? Hello. Mrs. Vandalor, how are you? Quite Henry. recovered, I hope. Oh, thank you so much. Lord yes. Fordle, did I hear you speak in the house or did I dream it? <laughs> Dorian, what a pleasure to see you again so soon. Dorian, you never told me you knew my nephew. I'm quite angry. Don't be. Dorian and I met briefly at a very disreputable painter's 
studio. Now, stop <laughs> showing off, Emmy, and sit. <laughs> Tell us what you know about Dartmoor and his American heiress. I believe she has quite made up her mind to propose to him, Aunt. Oh, well, <laughs> Someone should interfere. I'm told on excellent authority that her father keeps an American dry goods oh. store. <laughs> well, my uncle suggests he may be a pork packer. <laughs> now, what exactly are American dry goods? American novels. <laughs> Man. Take no notice of him, Mrs. Vandeleur. He never means anything he says. I'm they say good it. Americans go to Paris when they die. Where do the bad ones go? Right. America? <laughs> <laughs> he intrigued me, sitting there so watchful, smiling a little, glancing across the table from time to time, and occasionally crossing swords. I couldn't possibly agree with that. Oh, indeed. Orion. I can stand brute force, but brute reason is quite unbearable. It's unfair, hitting below the intellect. <laughs> <laughs> I am vexed with you, Harry, for trying to persuade Dorian not to play in Whitechapel. They won't miss him, aunt. His friends will. Anyway, the less said about the dark side of life, the better. The problem of the East End is very important. And quite so. It is the problem of slavery, and we try to solve it by amusing the slaves. <laughs> <laughs> You are a very naughty boy, Henry. Do you ever see that wife of yours? Often. At her father. <laughs> <laughs> this conversation is becoming too depressing. Aunt, I must leave you. Dorian, had you forgotten? Supper and before that, a turn in the park. He had promised to meet Basil Hallward, but he walked with me instead. It was the first of many such walks. We met often, at friends, at my club, in my house. Harry, how late you are. I'm afraid it is not Harry, Mr. Gray. I beg your pardon, I, I thought... You thought it was my husband. The past four weeks, he has rather monopolised you. You see, I know who you are. I know you quite well already by the 17 photographs my husband has. Not 17. 18, then. And I saw you at the opera the other night. Dear Lohengrin, I like Wagner's music better than anybody's. It is so loud, one can talk the whole time without anyone hearing what one says. A great advantage, don't you think? If one hears bad music, it is one's duty to drown it in conversation, Lady Henry. Yes. As Harry says... I always hear Harry's views from his friends. It is the only way I get to know of them. Harry. My love. So sorry I'm late, Dorian. I went to look after a piece of old brocade in Warder Street and had to bargain for hours. Nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. <laughs> Dorian, come. The library. Goodbye, Mr Gray. Harry, perhaps I shall see you later at Lady Thornbury's? I shouldn't be surprised, my dear. Never marry a woman with straw-coloured hair, Dorian. They are so sentimental. I like sentimental people. Never marry at all. Men marry because they're tired, women because they're curious. Both are disappointed. I'm unlikely to marry. Really? And why is that? I'm too much in love. That is one of your aphorisms, Harry. Uh, with whom are you in love? Her name is Sybil Vane. Never heard of her. No one has. They will do. She is a genius. My boy, no woman is a genius. Women represent the triumph of matter over mind, as men represent the triumph of mind over morals. How long have you known your genius? About three weeks. It was your fault. After first meeting you, I was filled with a wild desire to know everything about life. As I lounged in the park or strolled down Piccadilly, I used to watch everyone who passed me with mad curiosity. I had a passion for sensations. I determined to go in search of an adventure. An adventure? One evening, as I wandered into a labyrinth of grimy streets, I passed an absurd little theatre, all flaring gas jets and lurid playbills. And in front of the doors, a hideous man in a gaudy waistcoat and an enormous diamond in the centre of a soiled shirt. 
Have a box, my lord. Only a guinea to be transported, my lord. Transported by the Bard of Warwick. Only a guinea for a private box, my lord. It be a poison which the friar subtly has ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he shall be dishonoured because he married me before to Romeo. It was Romeo and Juliet. Oh, oh, oh. You are not to laugh, Harry. Romeo was a stout gentleman with corked eyebrows and a figure like a beer barrel. Mercutio had friends in the pit. He played to them in low comedy. Then, oh, imagine, Harry, a girl, hardly 17 years old, with a little flower-like face, a small Greek head with plaited coils of dark brown hair, eyes dark, velvet, lips like rose petals. Beauty, Harry. Real beauty. And in the pit, they ate oranges and nuts and drank beer, no doubt. <laughs> You're laughing. It's horrid of you. I have seen Sybil dying, sucking the poison from her lover's lips, seen her wandering the forest of Arden, watched her disguised as a pretty boy, seen her mad and innocent. Harry, why didn't you tell me that the only thing worth loving is an actress? Because I have loved so many of them, Dorian. Tell me, what are your actual relations with Sybil Vane? Harry, she is sacred. It is only the sacred things which are worth defiling. Why are you annoyed? She will belong to you one day. In love, one begins by deceiving oneself and ends by deceiving others. Methinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did sting his body upon a great fierce point. I went round after the third performance. The manager was determined that I should meet her. I was not entirely sure, yet he persuaded me. She was so gentle, so shy. Miss Vane, my lord here wanted to speak to you, my dear. I'm sure I'm grateful, sir. Maybe he'll give you a small token of appreciation of your wonderful performance. Miss Vane, I was truly dazzled by your performance. Sir, you are very kind. I will not call you my lord. You look more like a prince. I must call you Prince Charming. Upon my word, Dorian, Miss Sybil knows how to pay a compliment. You know nothing about it, as she knows nothing of the world. She regards life as another play. She lives with her brother, who is going to find his fortune in Australia. An honest enough boy, I suppose. As is her mother, a faded, sad-eyed woman who, no doubt, has seen better days. Depressing. I have been every night since. And neglect your friends. Dine with me tonight. I can't. She is Imogen tonight, and tomorrow Juliet again. Oh, I worship her. I want you to come and see her act. She must play a West End theatre. I, I will see she does. Bring Basil, if you like. Very well. Juliet, then, tomorrow. Will you see Basil, or shall I write to him? I haven't laid eyes on him for a week. It's rather horrid of me, as he has sent me my portrait in the most wonderful frame. Oh, write to him. I don't want to see him alone. He says things that annoy me. He gives me good advice. And people are fond of giving away what they need most themselves. It's what I call the depth of generosity. He seems to me something of a philistine. Artists, my dear Dorian, exist simply in what they make and consequently are perfectly uninteresting in what they are. I shall write to him. I went home late that evening... I had sat for much of the time in the window of my club and thought of Dorian, of how the purely sensuous instinct of boyhood becomes changed by imagination. I found a telegram waiting on the hall table. Harry, you shall be the first to know. I am engaged to be married to Sybil Vane. Oh, engaged indeed. Mother, Ma, I'm so happy. Sybil, my dear, 
You've always told me the only oh, place you were happy was He gives me such a green. feeling of being, oh, I don't know, alive, real. I'd die for him, Mum. Well, you can just put him out of your mind. You'll have to. I can't. Well, you're I going can't. to have to. Listen to me. Just listen and listen to your brother. Mr Isaacs has advanced us £50. Pounds. Fifty pounds and got us out of debt. He's been good to us. Fifty pounds and he owns me for three years of my life. I won't do it. You have to do it. For me, for your brother. I'm sorry. I'm ashamed to bring him here to show him how we live. And if he loves you, what will he care about where you live? You know we owe that money. Jim, tell your sister. Tell her. Oh, she won't listen. The only person she'll listen to is that print-up dandy. Jim! You don't even know his name. I'm not happy about this, Sybil. When Jim's in Australia, there'll just be the two of us. Now you talk of going off. What happens then? The Prince Charming has plenty. He'll be happy to look after you for my sake. Oh, Jim, tell her. Tell her, old bear, to be happy. <laughs> like me. I want everyone to be happy. We know you do, love. I want to talk to you. Come out for a walk, Sybil. I should like that, Jim. Two minutes. Mother, when I've made enough in Australia, I'll be back to pay off Isaacs and get Sybil off the stage, I promise you. I know you will, dear boy. Remember, you chose to do this. I hope the seafaring life will be what you truly want. Look, Ma, we've to been through this already. turn up the chance already. of mixing in society as a solicitor for going to sea. It's beyond me. I hate offices and I hate clerks. I know what I've chosen... But you see after Sybil, these men going round to talk to her every night. It's not right. Nonsense. It's merely a customer of the theatre. Why to pay a compliment? The young man in question's polite enough. The flowers he sends are lovely. You don't even know his name. Well, he's a gentleman. Well, he looks aristocracy, I must say. Looks, Ma. Appearances, Ma. Illusions. What she deals in every night. It's what you know, not what you think you know. They make a charming couple. It's happened before, Jim. If this aristocrat, this gentleman, harms a hair on her head, I shall kill him. I swear to you, Mother, I'll come back, find him out, and kill him. And the gigot of lamb, and before that, quails, and with the lamb champagne. Will that suit, Basil? Indeed it will. Is Dorian coming to dine? I wanted a word before he came. I suppose you've heard the news. Thank you, Jules. Uh, tell the cook we'll want it in half an hour. We're waiting for another guest. If it's politics, I'm not interested. Not a person in the commons worth painting, say, with whitewash. Dorian is engaged to be married. Impossible. <laughs> Impossible? To an actress. It's perfectly true. He's far too sensible, Harry. He's far too wise not to do foolish things now and again. She can hardly marry now and again. Except in America. I didn't say he was married. I said he was engaged. I have a distinct recollection of being married and none at all of being engaged. It's absurd. To marry so much beneath him. If you want to make him marry the girl, tell him so. Whenever a man does a foolish thing, it's always from the noblest motives. She'll be no good for him. She's better than good. She's beautiful. Dorian assures me. He's rarely wrong about such things. Your portrait of him has quickened his appreciation of human beauty. We are to see her tonight. Do you approve, Harry? Dorian Gray falls in love with an attractive girl who plays Juliet. Why not? If he married Messalina, he would be nonetheless interesting. <laughs> The problem with marriage is that it makes one unselfish, and unselfish people are dull people. I hope, Basil, that Dorian will make this girl his wife, be fascinated by her for, say, six months, and then passionately adore someone else. You don't mean a single word of that. You're much better than you pretend to be. Well, the reason we like to think so well of others is that we're all afraid of ourselves. The basis of optimism is sheer terror. Rubbish. You want to mar nature? Reform it. So, we see her tonight in some disreputable theatre in the East End. The boy is late, as usual.
The theatre's fat manager met us at the door, beaming an oily, tremulous smile. It was as if we had come to meet Miranda and found Caliban. The house was crowded that night. The heat was oppressive and the sunlight flamed like a monstrous dahlia with petals of yellow fire. Beneath us in the pit, youths lounged and yawned and shared their oranges with the tawdry girls who sat beside them. What a place to find one's divinity in. You may smile, Harry. You may even mock the idea of my loving this girl. She trusts me implicitly. Her touch changes me. A look from her changes me. Those fascinating, delightful, poisonous theories of yours, they're all wrong. She is divine. You shall see. And when she first stepped onto the stage, she did indeed look divine. She drew gasps of admiration even from the beasts swarming in the pit. Dorian gazed at her, motionless. Charming. Charming. She is delightful, Dorian. Quite delightful. These common, coarse people become quite different when she is on stage. They sit silently and watch her. They weep, they laugh as she wills them. One feels they're of the same flesh and blood as oneself. As oneself? Oh, I do hope not. Fain would I dwell on form. Fain, fain deny what I have spoke. But farewell, compliment. Dost thou love me? We watched this divine creature as she played the scene. We heard a voice, artificial in tone and strained in delivery. We saw mechanical gestures and unconsidered movements. Basil and I watched our dear friend while he watched the object of his love, and we pitied him. All about the house, the audience grew restive, yet Dorian stared unseeing at the puppet on the stage below. Poor Dorian. Dorian's face grew pale as he watched her. Her acting was absurdly superficial. She overemphasized everything. Beautiful passages of verse were declaimed with the painful precision of a schoolgirl. She moved listlessly and without purpose about the stage. She was a complete failure, as everyone, even Dorian, could recognize. She is beautiful, Dorian, but she cannot act. Let us go. I will see the play through. I'm awfully sorry that I've made you waste an evening, Harry. I apologize to you both. My dear Dorian, I should think Miss Vane was ill. We will come some other night. I wish it were illness. But she is cold, entirely changed. Last evening, she was a great artist. Now she is commonplace. Mediocre. Dorian, come with us. No need to grieve. You wouldn't want your wife to act, after all. So what does it matter if she plays Juliet like a wooden doll? She's very lovely. And if she knows as little about life as she does about acting, she will be a delightful experience. Go away. Please. Just go. We left the boy to his grief before the play had ended. Dorian. Oh, my dear, how badly I acted tonight. It was dreadful. You have no idea how I have suffered. But surely you understand. You do understand. Understand what? Before... Before I knew you, acting was the one reality of my life. One night I lived Portia, the next Rosalind. Beatrice's joy was my joy, the sorrows of Cordelia were mine also. I knew nothing but shadows. And I thought them real. Then you came, my love, and taught me what reality was. No. I saw tonight how shallow it all was. Dearest Dorian, I cannot play at being in love when I know what it truly is. You have killed my love. Dorian? No. You stirred my imagination. Now you don't even stir my curiosity. I loved you because you were marvellous, a genius because you gave shape and substance to the shadows of art. Tonight I see you for the shallow, stupid girl you are. A third-rate actress with a pretty face. Dorian, please, please! Don't touch me. 
I wish I'd never laid eyes on you. What can you know of love if you said Mars your art? Without your art, you are nothing. You're not serious, Dorian. You're acting. I leave the acting to you. You do it so well. Don't leave me. Say you love me. Don't leave me alone. I don't wish to be unkind, but I can't see you again. <gasps> you have disappointed me. <gasps> I don't remember where I went after leaving her. Dimly lit streets, gaunt, black-shadowed archways, evil-looking tenements. Drunks reeled by and women huddled over low fires near seeping walls. Children lay in grotesque bundles in doorways. As dawn came, I found myself near Covent Garden. The market was waking. Huge carts rumbled slowly down the polished streets. The air was heavy with the perfume of flowers. Cherries, have some on me, mate. Porters lay asleep on piles of sacking. Iris-necked pigeons ran about picking up seeds. I hailed a cab and returned home. The sky was pure pearl. Thin smoke rose from the chimneys opposite. I turned off the jets burning in the Venetian lantern that hung in the hall, threw my hat and cape on the table, and passed through the library towards the door of my bedroom. The portrait Basil had painted stood beside the bedroom door. Light seeped on the painting through the red velvet curtains. I glanced at it dismissively, then... Then something drew me back. I looked at it again in the full early morning light. I saw then what I'd half expected to see in my own mirror. It was changed, not I. So small a change, and yet, I saw it. There were lines where once my skin had been smooth, lines about the mouth and eyes, and then, then I remembered what I had said those weeks ago when it was finished, how there was nothing, there is nothing, nothing, nothing in the world that I would not give to remain as I am, that the baby should grow old. I would give my soul for that. My soul. No. Dear God. No. No! I searched then for a hand mirror and looked again at my own face. Smooth, untroubled, unlined. Yet in the image Basil had made, the set of lines about the mouth were tight, cruel. It wasn't possible, and yet... Yet... Had I been cruel to Sybil? If so, it was no great matter. Women are better able to bear sorrow than men. She was nothing to me now, nothing. Yet the picture, it seemed to hold the secret of my life. I'd dared to love my own beauty. I admit as much. Would it teach me to loathe my own soul? It's the light. I'm tired. Nothing's changed. Nothing. I'll go and see the girl. Make amends. Yes. Give up Harry and his poisonous little theories. That's what I'll do tomorrow. But first, sleep. Cover the picture. Up early. Hide it. It's nothing but a trick of the light. I'm so tired. Insist on seeing you. Go away, Harry. Go away. I'm writing a letter to you. I left instructions. A letter? I've quite decided never to see you again. Dorian, I'm very sorry for it all, but you must not blame yourself. You saw her, didn't you, last night, after the play was over? Sybil? Yes. I felt sure you had. Did you make a scene with her? I was perfectly brutal, Harry. But it's all right now. It has taught me to know myself better. I'm so glad you take it that way. I was afraid I'd find you plunged in remorse. I'm through all that. I now know what conscience is. It's not what you tell me. 
It's the divine in us. I want to be good. I can't bear the idea of my soul being hideous. A charming artistic basis for ethics, Dorian. I congratulate you on it. And how do you propose to begin? By marrying Sybil Vane. But, my dear Dorian... She used to be my wife. But didn't you get my letter? I sent it over by my own man. I have not read it yet. I didn't want to. You cut to pieces with your epigrams. You know nothing, then? Nothing? Dorian, don't be frightened. My letter was to tell you that Sybil Vane is dead. It's not true. It's a lie. How dare you say that? It is quite true, Dorian. It's in all the morning papers. There will be an inquest, of course. You must not be mixed up in it. Things like that make a man fashionable in Paris, but in London people are so prejudiced. What happened? Tell me, what happened? They say she... She swallowed something. A mistake, of course. Something they use in theatres, prussic acid or white lead. or Just very quick. Prussic acid, I should think. Harry, dear God. Yes. Yes, of course, it's very tragic. According to the standard, she was 17. She looked younger than that. She knew so little about acting. <sighs> Come with me to the opera tonight. Everybody will be there. I have murdered Sybil Vane. What shall I do? There is nothing you can do. Ignore it. You have no idea of the danger I'm in, Harry. There is nothing to keep me straight. She would have done that for me. If you married this girl, you would have been wretched. The only way a woman deforms a man is by boring him so much that he loses all interest in her. The whole thing would have been an absolute failure. Why is it that I can't feel this tragedy as much as I want to? What has really happened, Dorian? Someone has killed herself for love of you. I wish that I had ever had such an experience. It would have made me in love with love for the rest of my life. She had no right to kill herself. It was selfish of her. I assure you, Dorian, most women can sell themselves for a lost love without dying for it. Somewhere sentimental colours. Never trust a woman who is fond of pink ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> Others fling their conjugal felicity in your face, yet others turn to religion. You know, nothing makes one so vain as being told one is a sinner. <laughs> Sybil Vane chose another, more surprising way. That's all. I was terribly cruel to her. Women appreciate cruelty more than anything. They have wonderfully primitive instincts. Dorian, don't waste tears on Sybil Vane. She was less real than the part she played. Harry, you have explained me to myself. You said something I felt but was afraid to say. We won't talk of it again. It has been a most marvellous experience. That's all? That's all. I wonder if life still has in store anything as wonderful. There is nothing that you, with your extraordinary good looks, will not be able to do. Suppose I become haggard and old and wrinkled. Uh, then you would have to fight for your victories. <laughs> now, dress and we'll drive down to the club. I think I shall join you at the opera. I feel too tired to eat anything. You've been such a friend to me, Harry. Thank you. Our friendship is only beginning... At nine, then. My sister's box on the grand tier. Dear, dear Dorian, how are you? My dear chef. Good evening, Dorian. Dinner tomorrow? Oh, God, the river. Divine. Quite divine. My dear Dorian. Hey, my dear Dorian. Oh, very nice to see you. Thank 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 you. you. Thank 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 My life is decided. Eternal youth. The picture does that for me. 
I have only to look in the mirror to see it's true. No lines, no cruel cast of the mouth or the eyes. I'm truly free. Infinite passion. Pleasures subtle and secret, wild joys and wilder sins. I can have all those and there will be no change. I shall kiss the lips of the portrait and thank it for bearing the burden of whatever shame might burden me. <laughs> it will be a mirror of my life. I was disappointed not to find you at home last night, Dorian. Someone said you were seen at the opera. <laughs> gave the lie to that, of course. But Basil, I was there. Harry's sister, Lady Gwendolyn, was there too. Perfectly charming she is. You went to the opera? And the woman you love still lying in some sordid lodgings? You, you talk of other women being charming and the girl not yet in the quiet of her grave. Do stop it, Basil. Stop. What's past is past. But you called yesterday the past. Time has nothing to do with it. A man who can master himself can end a sorrow as easily as he can invent a pleasure. I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them, enjoy them, dominate them. That's horrible. You talk as if you had no heart, no pity in you. It is all Harry's influence, I see that. I owe a great deal to Harry, more than I owe to you. You only taught me to be vain. Now, what do you want? The Dorian Gray I used to paint. Good heavens, man, Sybil Vane has just killed herself. Indeed so. At least it wasn't a vulgar accident. Her death has all the pathetic senselessness of martyrdom. I suffered immensely. Then it passed away. You came to console me and feel angry because I don't need your consolation. I came to comfort you. I won't mention it again, if you'd rather... But your name will be dragged into it. The inquest. The mother. <laughs> she only ever knew my Christian name. I must commission you to make a drawing of Sybil. I should like something of her more than the memory of a few kisses and some pathetic words. I will try to do something. If you will come and sit for me, please. I can't get on without I you. I can never sit for you again, Basil. Impossible. But why? Don't you like the portrait? It's my best work. Where is it? Have you put it in another room? I was sure it was in here. Is it behind the screen? Don't. If you move that screen, if you look at that portrait again, I swear our friendship is over. Everything will be finished between us. But I want to exhibit the picture in Paris. I will not allow it. No one shall see the picture. But Dorian... Never! Say at least that you will sit for me again. Impossible. I can't explain it to you, Basil. There is something fatal about your picture. It has a life of its own. Life of I will come and have tea with you. That I can promise. But you must never ask me to sit again. Not to see the portrait. You rang, sir. Did the housekeeper do as I asked and give you the key to the old schoolroom? It's no use, sir. The attic room at the top of the house. I know where my old schoolroom is. Be good enough to bring me the key. Don't, don't look at me so... Get out, get the key! I have the key, sir. And be kind enough to take this picture and to follow me with it. Mrs Leaf said she wished to clear out the schoolroom before you went into it. She was sure it would be full of dust and cobwebs and old lumber, sir. Which I expect and want. Can you carry it alone? Yes, sir. It's heavy, but... Come on, then. Mind the corner. Can you manage? Yes, sir. Be careful. Very careful. All right. Yes, sir. Careful. Good. In with it, then. Is there enough light? Yes, sir. In the corner, sir. Yes. Yes, there in the dark corner. Safe resting place. Keep it covered. 
Leave me. Yes, sir. Did you see the notice in the St. James this evening? I don't believe I did. The inquest. Sybil Vane. Death by misadventure, it seems. Her mother was much affected. And I have no wish to be hurry. None whatsoever. I spent the afternoon reading that book you sent me. I was fascinated. More wine? I thought you'd like it. I didn't say I liked it, Harry. I said it fascinated me. Oh, so you've discovered the difference. I'm so pleased. Sure, we'll cover it. One more look. One more. God, it changes even as I. <laughs> what the worm is to the corpse, my sins will be to this painted image. They may defile it, they may make it shameful, but nobody will suspect. Nobody will know. We have to take our moment to live as we want to live. Look once more, then be done. See the gold hair. The curls. The blue eyes, the red lips. They seem slightly... slightly twisted. Cooler than before. Are they? Are they? In the first part of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, dramatised for radio by Nick McCarty, Jamie Glover played Dorian Gray, Ian McDermott, Lord Henry Wooten, and Stephen Pacey Basil. Sybil was played by Tilly Gaunt, Jim, Harry Myers, Mrs. Vane, Elizabeth Mansfield, Lord Fermor, Brett Usher, Aunt Agatha, Mary Wimbush, the theatre manager, Gavin Muir, Lady Wooten, Elizabeth Bell, Lady Narborough, Tessa Worsley, and the servant, Tom George. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Original music was composed and played by David Chilton. The pianist was Simon Moorcroft. The picture of Dorian Gray was directed by Gordon House. <laughs>